So uh, today we're getting up to speed on environmental impacts and metrics. Uh, we've begun already uh, talking about metrics. Today we're going to, as I walk out of the room, see how the cameras do on that. Uh, we're going to clean up some material on EDIP. So EDIP uh, comes from the uh, refrigerator example. Uh, and we will talk about one way of uh, not only characterizing, but uh, coming up with a valuation of different impacts that might emanate from the life cycle of a refrigerator. We'll talk about Eco Indicator 99. Uh, and we're not going to go too much farther than we did already. But what we're going to do is you may remember that we had this figure that showed how the chain of events goes from emissions. Uh, through to characterization, uh, classification, characterization, and valuation. And we'll use that slide to talk about some of those environmental impacts, because that's essentially the topic of assignment one. And we'll throw some other questions in there. And the main point of today is to be a group discussion. Uh, but I will cover EDIP, use Ecoindicator 99, as well as the Tracy method uh, to cover uh, a recap of uh, assignment one. Okay. So that's where we're going today. Let's uh, just remind ourselves what impact analysis is about. Remember, it has you know, life cycle assessment has four stages. Life cycle impact assessment has three stages. And this can be uh, quantitative as well as qualitative. And whereas the inventory stage was quantitative, uh, impact inherently is going to cover some qualitative, possibly subjective factors. And uh, the impact analysis is used to characterize and assess the effects of resource requirements and environmental loading uh, that have been identified during the inventory stage. So an impact assessment does not happen without an inventory assessment first. Okay, and the three uh, stages, uh, beginning with classification. What was classification? Definition of classification. Go ahead. Putting them into groups of stressors. Exactly. So taking your emissions and throwing them into stressor buckets. And once you have the stressor buckets, one might be, uh, you know, it could be climate change as a stressor, ozone depletion as a stressor. Uh, what comes after classification? Characterization. Characterization. Thank you. You got a definition for us? Estimation of the the impact of so using impact to define impact. Uh, you looking for uh, quantification? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is exactly the point where you take uh, your stressors now and you try to understand the magnitude of the impact. I'll use the word too. Uh, relative to the other uh, stressors in that bucket. So we might come up with global warming potential for. Uh, a relative magnitude of the potential impacts of different emissions. Okay, so what are the different uh, greenhouse gases that we might be concerned with? Good. Carbon dioxide, methane, uh, CFCs, um, then um, what are the others? Carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs. Carbon dioxide, awesome. Uh, I think I heard CFCs. Yeah. Great. HFCs. HFCs. Wow, we're throwing around a lot of uh, <laughs> acronyms around. And uh, so HFC, CFCs, uh, HCFCs, uh, what are those things? Uh, CFCs, start there. Good? Chlorofluorocarbons. Chlorofluorocarbons. And uh, what are they known for? Refrigerants. They're refrigerants. Ozone depleters. Ozone depleters, we'll get to that topic in a minute. Their ability okay. to trap heat. And the ability to, to trap heat. heat. About and, 20, uh, times that, that makes that them greenhouse gases. Long lifetime. Long lifetime in the atmosphere. So why might you find, at least in the old days before they were banned, uh, CFCs in the um, insulation of a refrigerator? They're very chemically stable. So they're stable. Right, you don't want the inside of your foam, like your, your insulating foam, to explode. Nor your refrigerants, right? So you got some compression expansion. You know, that, that could be dangerous. And that's why CFCs were created in the first place. But what does the uh, 
uh, why would you use something like a CFC inside of Figure? They're cheap. Oh, they're cheap. Yeah, they're cheap now, right? The systems to produce them, but at least they were. Actually, smuggling of CFCs was a very lucrative business for a while, you know, as they were being phased out. So up there with the illicit drug trade, at least there were some reports of that. I can't verify that was true, but uh, you know there was a uh, desire to continue using these chemicals. Good. You didn't uh, see any like immediate impacts from so the environment and the ways that it did. All right. So thinking about CFCs as a as a, a chemistry that uh, work well as a refrigerant. Uh, you know, res replacing ammonia and some other sort of nasties that were being used uh, as refrigerants at that time. You know, not having that long view that uh, you know, it took maybe 60 years to figure out uh, what they might be doing to the ozone layer. Now, let me ask the question in a different way. From a technical perspective or uh, a functional perspective in the refrigerator, why might we use CFCs? Okay. They're thermodynamically very good. Uh, they, you don't need to work in very high pressures. And uh, you, the compressor doesn't need, you don't need to use a lot of energy in, in compressing it either. So Excellent. So that uh, not only stable, but they, they function well in the uh, refrigeration cycle. And how about in the foam? One last thing. What function do they serve there? Lightweight. Uh, I, I can't evaluate that one. So if they, if they uh, insulate in the atmosphere as greenhouse gases, you think they do the same in your refrigerator? All right, so you know, the idea that you know, your refrigerator works, you know, it's going to hold, you know, let's say, keep the heat out uh, you know, when you unplug it, you know, say the power goes out. Right? So you, you need an insulating substance there because you want your refrigerator to uh, not just to be allowing heat in or else it has to work harder. Right? So you have these foams, and you know, CFCs had been commonly used uh, because they essentially trap the heat, to keep the heat out, essentially, in that case. So um, you, know, you think that that function works well in your refrigerator. It probably does the same thing in the atmosphere. right? So uh, it's, a, it's a greenhouse gas. Now, the um, HFCs, replacement refrigerants, HCFCs, same function. All right, so uh, hydrochlorofluorocarbons uh, uh, take some of the chlorine out, replace them with hydrogen. And uh, what is it about, what uh, element in the CFCs actually leads to ozone depletion? Fluorine ions. Fluorine? The ions, yeah, fluorine ions, yeah. Fluorine. CLO. Fluorocarbons. Uh, let's vote. Is it fluorine? How many vote for fluorine? Okay, my reaction gave it away. Chlorine? Rats. All right. I, I think, all right. Uh, what other, so, so uh, explain to us what happens in uh, the, the um, y'all got it. All right. The, uh, the reaction pathway for ozone depletion. I mean, not, I just in general terms. Go ahead. Uh, the chlorine monoxide radicals, they combine with uh, oxygen, the oxide free radical. And uh, it forms ClO2. ClO plus O dot gives ClO2. Uh, what happens is this ozone, uh, this ozone free, uh, I mean oxygen free radical is supposed to combine with oxygen to form ozone. But ClO combines with it to form chloride, uh, chlorine dioxide. So this is, in a sense, it prevents uh, ozone O3 from forming. So there's a depletion. Tom, are you there? Yes. Uh, you pretty much nailed that. Uh, how many people understood what he was talking about? Nice. Then we move on. Uh, what else, uh, what other free radicals besides the uh, chlorine free radical lead to uh, ozone depletion? The, fluoride, the flu flu fluoride ions also lead to ozone depletion, but the thing is uh, when you use chlorine, it's, it, it gets regenerated. So uh, although the fluorine does react to take away, uh, to deplete the ozone, it doesn't get regenerated and it, a single molecule doesn't do as much damage as a single chlorine. Nowhere near as much to the yeah. point where we barely even talk about it, right? And we certainly wouldn't have the hole we have today. Uh, so while that, and there are other uh, chemicals too that have the same impact, but this idea that the series chain reaction that Prashant uh, laid out for us starts with a chlorine-free radical. And the problem with it is that it ends with a chlorine-free radical, too. So you can just go out and destroy more ozone. 
Now, there is another free radical uh, that is often found in flame retardants that does the same thing. It's even worse than chlorine. Right. Flame retardants, didn't give it away. Starts with a B. Uh, thank you. So, uh, and the key is that really the only way to lock this down is uh, for ultimately that chlorine to, to leave the atmosphere. And the pathways to do that take a very long time. So we can stop emitting uh, brominated substances and uh, these uh, very stable chlorinated substances that find their way into the stratosphere. And uh, from there, uh, it will still take decades for uh, the ozone hole to return or I'm sorry, the ozone sort of return uh, to concentrations that, have, that it had been prior to the release of these substances. Okay. So getting a sense now of classification versus characterization, we could talk about the relative ozone depletion potential of a brominated substance versus a chlorinated substance. Right. So that is what this uh, characterization step is. So if I can read it to Vanti, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the relative magnitude. That's what happens in the second stage. Then the valuation stage is saying, OK, well, I have sort of a net impact on ozone depletion. I have a net impact on global warming. I'm going to somehow try to assign relative values and come up with a score. Those are the three steps of an impact assessment. Uh, this is, and we've seen this slide before also, midpoint versus endpoint. We've defined these two things. What is a midpoint indicator? Do I see it? That describes the mechanism by which damage occurs. So uh, you can think of it as a uh, a mechanism or a pathway or an intermediary through which some ultimate impact, the ones we care about, damage to ecosystems, damage to humans, um, damage to the availability of resources for future generations. And those are the endpoints. And in between is something about resource consumption, something about, in this case, infrared radiative forcing. Uh, so some of you have attended office hours. Some of you have taken a look at the, uh, uh, the archive optional video on global warming. What is infrared radiative forcing? This is up here. Be brave. We didn't cover any class. It's not in the reading. So how about a guess? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, the ability of the gas to uh, absorb and then reflect back the radiative heat from the Earth. I think that was an excellent definition. So if you think about, uh, let's think of a steady state that might have existed before the Industrial Revolution. In terms of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, just to keep it simple, let's talk about CO2 concentrations. So now uh, we start pumping all kinds of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. So you go from you know, 260 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere uh, to now above 380, maybe 390 uh, parts per million. Okay? So you can think of there being a change, a forcing. And that turns out to be a positive forcing because you can think about these gases as being a blanket. And the blanket gets thicker. So the opportunity for a photon of, of energy, maybe from the sun, that's going to, you know, it's an infrared energy that's coming from the sun. You know, for, you know, that infrared energy that strikes the Earth's surface to actually escape again, right, to radiate uh, the heat from Earth, that chance is reduced as there are more molecules of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Because as Joe mentioned, what happens is that these greenhouse gas molecules, what they do is they tend to uh, resonate at the frequencies, it, it, let's say the infrared frequencies, right? So the heat. And so what happens, just like a cloudy winter night, uh, the water molecules in the sky, they, 
you know, basically they grab the heat and then they re-radiate it. So they could think of it as being some kind of a resonance that occurs and uh, that energy, when it bounces back out of the molecule, some of it goes back out in space, some of it returns back to Earth. So the more of that you have happening in the atmosphere, the warmer the ground's going to be, therefore global warming. Infrared radiative forcing is a, think of it as a force change off of what you might think of as a steady state. Okay, so that's a loose definition. It has uh, units, watts per meter squared. So uh, you can think of the change in the forcing leading to a uh, change in the amount of power actually reaching the surface of the Earth per area, per unit area. And big numbers in that realm is like a watt per meter squared. And you think about light bulbs, you say, well, it doesn't take um, that much of a forcing to have uh, potential changes in temperature. So, uh, you know, the lectures you have in the video uh, and uh, what Song's been uh, offering in his office hours sort of go through that process. How does an emission become a change in an, air, uh, in an atmospheric concentration of a greenhouse gas? How does that change in a concentration of a greenhouse gas become a change in a forcing? How does a change in a forcing lead to a change in the surface temperature of Earth? So uh, that is a process, but that forcing is not the same thing as the change in the temperature. It's not the same thing as the um, impact on people. It's not the same thing as the impact on plants. Therefore, it's a midpoint. Okay. So there's a lot going on with this global warming thing, and it's just one of uh, several metrics we might talk about. That kind of makes sense at a high level. Okay, midpoints and endpoints. So these are uh, midpoints that we looked at for the refrigerator based on the inventory. So we've talked a little bit about global warming and we've talked a little bit about ozone depletion already. And we might express a characterization of global warming as being equivalent CO2 concentration. And there's actually different ways to do that CO2 equivalency that we won't uh, get into here. For ozone depletion, you might talk about equivalent emissions of CFC-11. Uh, let's go down the list further, at least a couple more of these. Uh, so acidification, what is that? <coughs> Change in the pH in water. Change in the pH in water. Uh, yes. Uh, and where does acidification come from? Pollution. Pollution, what kind of pollution? Go ahead. Uh, an increase in the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, causes, when it equilibrates... Well, that's acidification the of the oceans, right? So uh, that uh, is generally connected with what? CO2 emissions. Uh, so when we talk about concern about... Uh, the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere affecting the oceans. What are we usually talking about? What do you mean, what are we usually talking Climate about? Climate change. Yeah. Um, so, so that's CO2 concentration. It's normally not expressed as grams of SO2 equivalent. Oh, what okay. you're talking about. Oh, yeah, right? yeah I missed so that. So that's Sorry. different acidification, right? <laughs> so uh, glad, glad we asked the question here. So we can talk about, and normally what people think about, people other than Andy, they normally think about, is when the, um, we release greenhouse gas uh, gases to the atmosphere, uh, we think about uh, you know, terrestrial ecosystems getting warmer. And then we might think about plants, and we might think about people and insects and diseases, and, and we might even think about sea level rising. Right? But what we don't normally think about is the impact that the change in the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would have on the pH of the ocean. And that's, you know, essentially that's an acidification process, it is. And it can have profound consequences on the uh, food web in the ocean. 
That is not the acidification that they're talking about here. Uh, but it is a very real concern. And some might say it's a bigger concern. So I like that answer a lot. Well, let's talk about sulfur-based uh, acidification that we might think about from uh, coal-fired power plants. Matthew? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more of a regional effect. And it's due to the burning of uh, coal that has a high sulfur content. And the issues associated with it now are that uh, power plants have higher and higher uh, emission stacks. And they're trying to move things further away from the immediate area, which is getting into the upper level winds, which can actually affect uh, a larger geographic region. So pollution is a solution to pollution. So, uh, so Matthew hit it on the head. So sulfur dioxide is toxic. Okay. So if you have, uh, and it's not just coal-fired power plants. You can have sulfur emitted from a smelter. Copper smelter is a good example. Uh, so you have a lot of sulfur dioxide coming out of the smokestack. You see all the vegetarian, vegetarian vegetation around. Sorry, uh, they get hurt too, I guess. Uh, the the uh, surrounding area get uh, gets impacted, right? So you basically the vegetation dies around the, the smokestack. So it's toxic. So and that has negative impacts on people too. Sends them to the hospital. Uh, even worse than that. Uh, so what do you do if you're concerned about sort of sulfur poisoning of the surrounding area, you do what Matthew suggests is you, you increase the uh, height of the smokestack. So then, you know, nearby, no problem. But what happens there is the uh, sulfur dioxide gets uh, high enough into the sky that it will stay there over multiple days, uh, convert itself into sulfuric acid, essentially, and come down, you know, maybe a thousand miles away as um, uh, basically acid rain, okay? And that can have impacts on lakes. You know, if you have a lake that does not have a, a sort of a chemical buffering capacity, then, uh, you know, maybe it's not a limestone lake, but it's a granite-based lake, um, then, you know, pH can, can drop in that lake rather quickly, and that affects fish, for instance. It can affect buildings. It can affect agriculture. Um, anything I'm missing there, uh, and the aquatic ecosystem. So that's fairly significant. Now, it's not just sulfur dioxide, right? What other emissions can lead to that same uh, acid rain precipitation? Uh, nitrate. Uh, so uh, nitrogen oxides, NOx. And where do those come from? Automobile, Go ahead. Uh, automobile the, uh, emissions, tailpipes. Yeah, so tailpipe emissions from cars. So uh, one study where I'm familiar with that they've added up the sulfur emissions and the NOx emissions uh, dealt with the uh, black forest in, in Germany. And they were looking because the forest was um, not doing very well, particularly in the 90s, uh, before a lot of these acid controls came into effect. And it's still not totally healthy now. Uh, but they found that roughly half came from sulfur and energy production, the other half NOx from automobile exhaust, mostly other industrial processes too. So NOx and SOx, and here uh, we're talking about grams of sulfur dioxide equivalent. Uh, you can talk about moles of protons uh, just as well. Okay. Acid forming uh, protons. Okay. Acidification, anything else we should talk about there? Does that work? Nutrient enrichment. Why are nutrients a bad thing? You know, my mom always told me uh, nutrients are good. So uh, why would I be concerned about this? Got my. Uh, referring to eutrophication. That didn't help me at all. So uh, <laughs> that's just a bigger word that's hard to describe. So what's eutrophication? Um, so it's it's where nutrients from like fertilizers uh, they might run off into a larger water system, and then they cause an uh, algal bloom, um, and then as the algae dies, it decomposes and accepts the from the water, killing the wildlife. Wow, that sounds complicated. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mike? <laughs> that makes sense? Everybody catch it? Go ahead. Is the oxygen just sucked up from the water because of the decomposition and because of bacteria eating it, or is there another chemical process going on there? Question to Mike. From a... Uh, it's the chemical process of the as the bacteria eat it, eat it, they use up the oxygen in order to digest the plant matter. Everybody agree? All right. Thank you.
So, uh, and we're going to uh, talk more about oxygen demand uh, starting on uh, at our next session. So this is uh, grams of nitrate equivalent. Is nitrate the only uh, eutrophying stressor that we might be concerned about? Good. Uh, so uh, where does phosphorus come from? Um, it's from plants and from fertilizers. Fertilizers is a good culprit. Uh, what about nitrates? Where do nitrates come from? Fertilizers. Uh, uh, in the subdivision where I live, there's a pond, a retention pond, it's supposed to help with flood control and all this. And you know, everybody puts this stuff on their on their yard. And this would be a nice thing to look at, uh, except that uh, you know, just algae all over the place, and uh, it's not aerated particularly well. So. Um, you know, and you've probably all seen something similar. So a rapid acceleration of the, the aging and essentially a destruction of the ecosystem follows from, from that, especially if you want, usually the desirable things that, you know, fish, let's say, that live in the, uh, in the water require some oxygen anyway. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, nitrogen definitely comes most probably from fertilizers, but there's also atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. And that's important. So atmospheric deposition is... Um, uh, is, is one of the pathways uh, through which you can have some eutrophying stress. And the other thing, too, is you know, we talk about NOx emissions and how bad they are. And, and that's true in cities, right? But you drive, you know, maybe you're driving down uh, you know, a, a rural highway and you've got NOx emissions, and they may, to some extent, be helping to fertilize the plants. I mean, not to say that's a great thing, but uh, you know, that, you know, it's, it's both sides of the equation here. Other points? Um, this can also be a problem, especially for ecosystems that evolved under uh, very little nitrogen. So these ecosystems can quickly change due to the nitrogen deposition because uh, the species that are uh, more evolved to uh, use less nitrogen get outcompeted by the new species that can use more of the nitrogen. That's great. So this idea of a limiting nutrient. Ecosystems, uh, aquatic ecosystems, uh, usually have something that's uh, limiting uh, the growth of uh, you know, the. Uh, it could be at a microbiological level, typically, uh, and you know it could be nitrogen, could be phosphorus, and the minute you start having these anthropogenic emissions uh, into that ecosystem, then you know it changes the dynamics of the populations that might live there. So uh, this is important too. So too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. The nutrient enrichment store, eutrophication store. How about uh, photochemical ozone formation? Do we have any atmospheric chemists in the room? What is this one about? We do. So, go to the atmospheric <laughs> chemist, please. Um, when you have uh, when you have NOx in the atmosphere, along with uh, um, along with things like uh, volatile organic compounds, along with the sunlight, they form. Uh, uh, photochemical smog, so that uh, and o ozone is normally formed because of nitrogen, uh, and nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere. So uh, what happens is ultraviolet light strikes the strikes the molecule and it r lets go of one uh, oxygen-free radical and uh, that uh, forms ozone in the atmosphere. That, that actually works pretty well, uh, except you use some terms that at least I'd never heard of. Volatile organic what? <laughs> All right, uh, so we got to talk about those. Um, let's talk about smog at a higher level. Okay, um, it's ozone. Is that all it is? Pan. Uh, Peroxy acetyl nitrate. <laughs> yes. All right, let's just keep uh, irritating everybody. You know, that's that's you know, one of potentially hundreds of of chemicals, uh, photochemical oxidants that uh, uh, might be in smog. So smog is, is brown stuff, right? We've all seen, does anybody not seen smog? I want to go there before you grew up. <laughs> all right, so uh, you know, major metropolitan areas have seen this sort of haze. You might have flown over it, uh, sort of muck in the air. And that's not just ozone, right? If it was just ozone, you know, think about like lightning strikes, you know, and if you had a lot of lightning, you might see a lot of this brown stuff forming. Well, no, right, because ozone's invisible. Uh, so uh, that ain't ozone, right? So uh, there's some other uh, chemistry that is going on. 
And uh, you know, if I were to say perhaps more slowly and not as well as Siddhar, you know, we, we have some components that lead to the soup being formed. Right? So one he mentioned was Knox. Another was sunlight. Another were these volatile organic compounds. And I'm missing one more ingredient. Hydrocarbons. Uh, hydrocarbons can be volatile organic compounds. So they're, let's put them in the same bucket. Go ahead, Andrew. I think it's UV rays. So, uh, yeah, you need um, sunlight, essentially. But uh, it's the UV rays. But I'm looking for temperature there. So these reactions don't occur below 65 degrees, generally. So one of these test questions I used to like to ask when we covered this in class was, you know, you've got a traffic jam in Detroit in, you know, on January 15th, uh, you know, uh, and the traffic level doubles. What do you think is going to happen to the smog level? And it's just this trick question because it's probably not 65 degrees. Although that question used to be easier to ask because uh, you could get a 60 degree day these days. But, uh, um, you know, there is no smog below those temperatures. So you need the, you need the temperature there also. And what happens is, essentially, uh, you, you have a combination of uh, those UV photons, uh, the NOx, and the volatile organic compounds coming together uh, to create wacky chemistry. I mean, you could take a semester of atmospheric chemistry and still not totally understand. This is one of those things that the more you know, the harder it gets. Uh, in terms of what that soup actually is and, and um, uh, you know, what impacts it might have on people. We do know that uh, the higher the uh, smog levels are, uh, the more likely people are to end up in the hospital with sort of respiratory and cardiac issues. So that cause and effect is known at a high level. But the, you know, what one um, additional unit of NOx emission is going to be uh, in terms of increasing smog, you, you cannot really answer that question easily. So uh, typically what uh, folks do is they might talk about ethylene or ethane or butane equivalent in some atmosphere under some standard conditions. And they'll talk about that as being your photochemical ozone creation potential. Okay, so here uh, ethylene perhaps. Uh, equivalent or ethane. Okay. So these are some of the heavy hitters. We talked about you know human toxicity uh, being difficult to measure at a lot of levels, right? If we talk about a disability adjusted life year, you know how do we actually get there? You know we might, in this case, uh, you know think about how much water we would uh, have to dilute the water emissions to for it to be safe to drink and or ingest in some other way. Right. So with ecotox and with human toxicity uh, with in air and water, that's essentially what they're doing here. And then they're just quantifying the weight. So these are examples of uh, midpoint uh, indicators. And I want to talk a little bit about EDIP here, how we might further characterize and prioritize these emissions. Any questions on this? You did all right? <coughs> okay, so let's talk about EDIP. So uh, how might we further interpret uh, those midpoint indicators? So uh, one idea that they lean upon in EDIP is the, what's called the person equivalent. Okay, So you could think, and, and you see this MPE90, milli person equivalence uh, relative to the uh, co total contribution in 1990. So uh, let's suppose we're talking about uh, global warming potential or, or uh, grams of CO2 equivalent. We're talking about that. And we say the average person in 1990 had you know, X grams of CO2 equivalent. Okay. What the milli person equivalent does 
is say, okay, uh, what fraction of that average person's emission in 1990 is represented by the life cycle of this product? So basically the person equivalent, they divide it by 1,000, and then they call it a milliperson equivalent. If they simply had divided it by 100, it would have been the fraction. <laughs> but they chose not to do that. So uh, five, yeah, I don't know. So the milliperson equivalent, uh, five milliperson equivalents is half a percent. Okay, and 10 milliperson equivalents is 1%. So that would be 1% of the product life cycle's contribution relative to the average person's contribution in 1990. Now notice that um, the life cycle is not over one year, but the person equivalent is. So this is an annual emission in 1990 per person. Uh, go ahead. National or world average? Uh, it depends. So they have some uh, that are Dutch and some that are uh, not Dutch, Danish. Uh, somebody's going to kill me. Uh, <laughs> Right, uh, in Denmark, uh, some that are Europe and some that are world. Uh, these are world, mostly world. When we get to target, it's mostly Denmark. Because uh, this example comes from the 90s, and there weren't as many world targets as there are now. And in Denmark, they'd gotten to these targets a bit faster. Yeah. And that'll become clear in a second. Okay. So uh, let's just take a look at this. So uh, using the milliperson equivalent idea, for the refrigerator, you see that global warming is somewhere around 30 uh, milliperson equivalent. So that's about 3% of the average 1990 um, uh, person's contribution to global warming. Okay? So the, uh, and you see here, uh, this goes to Nicholas's uh, uh, point. Uh, you see in the, in the units here on the x-axis, it says WDK. So it's the world and Denmark. And which ones are Denmark and which ones are world, I can't tell you because they haven't said that here on this uh, slide. But they're mixing them together. Right. Ozone depletion is 240. So that's 24% of the average 1990 person's uh, contribution. Okay. And most of these are smaller. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you know, global warming isn't important or, or uh, photochemical ozone isn't important or nutrient enrichment isn't important. I mean, you can imagine where we've got a big problem today where there's a lot of emission. And even a small additional contribution could be a big deal. So this doesn't necessarily rank the relative importance of global warming versus ozone depletion. Uh, but it does give you some idea internally relative to an average person's uh, uh, yearly contribution uh, to that impact category, what the life cycle of this product does. Okay, you see coal's pretty big, above uh, 4% there. Right. Does this make sense? Beginning to interpret these uh, uh, categories. Go ahead. 24% of the things that I do in a year contribute to ozone depletion? It would be like saying that buying this refrigerator uh, essentially uh, adds to your footprint another 24% of what you would have emitted uh, in a year. So I'll try that again. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's 1990, you're the average person, and you're responsible for a certain amount of the world's ozone depletion. Okay, just divvy that up equally and that's your share. You just went out and bought this LER 200, and that went up by 25%. That's what it means. Does that make sense? Uh, good. Is it split like over the lifetime of the fridge? Because if I have it's like ten collapsing years. it all at once. Yeah. So okay. it's like a like a singularity. Okay. So it doesn't take the time uh, nature of these impacts into account. So where that's really important is in human toxicity and ecotoxicity, right? If I had to take X grams of something nasty and you know, and drink it all at once, you know. I, I would not prefer that to sort of spreading that out over my life. This type of analysis does not account for uh, temporal effects. Okay. So, you know, it's not the same thing as adding 
uh, be, it, you know, in 1990 because it's sort of divided out over the lifetime of the refrigerator. But uh, this metric doesn't consider that, collapses it all together. Uh, go ahead. Percent of what? The average person's contribution. Contribution to what? To ozone depletion? To, well, in this case, it'd be ozone depletion. You just take the zero off, so 240 divided by 10 is 24 percent. Of the total ozone depletion is contributed by one person? It's 24 percent of that quantity. Right. It's not clear to me if the original quantity includes fridge use. Well, that's just it. So I was a little tentative when I said that. So um, basically, people have been buying refrigerators, but not necessarily this one, right? So uh, you take the ozone depletion contribution, that magnitude, that total magnitude, divide it by the number of people. And yes, people have refrigerators, and you did too, but now the, the question is about this new refrigerator that's coming into its life, it's on top of that. Right, but an older fridge, like a, if the previous fridge, it doesn't say if it's 240 or 300 or... No, because this is the uh, interpretation of the impact of this refrigerator. So yes, you could be doing more harm than good, right? Right, that's... Yeah, that it won't account question. for that, unless you do a comparative LCS, okay. then it will. That's a great question. Hey, Matthew? Sorry, just... Another question about the accounting for this. If you bought, let's say, this same refrigerator each year, you're saying that, that it's 24% for that year and it's only counted in, in that year. This is an interpretation of the numbers. This is not to be taken too low. Okay. So, um, you know, I think we're, some of these questions are coming from a perspective that the accounting here is good. It is. All right. Uh, so, essentially, what's going on here is you're saying what new ozone depletion stressors exist because this refrigerator came into being. And so you're saying now that's 25% of the typical person's load in a year comes into being. So if you bought one this year and you bought one next year and you bought one next year, you know, as long as you didn't destroy the old one, you know, this would be out of the currency. You know if there are any plans to update that person equivalent to reflect um, different pollution makeup or the person as time goes on? So as, uh, yeah, this is great. Uh, no, I'm not aware of it. So this is, uh, you know, the, the question is to what extent these metrics get updated. Eco indicator 99 is still 99. Uh, this came from the mid-90s, and I haven't seen it updated, uh, you know, conceptually. Right. Uh, so these are ways to think about interpreting data. Uh, this community that's actually doing this is not particularly large, and is not a. This is not a field with a lot of money in it. So uh, it helps you interpret results. As for instance, we try to address IPCC targets for greenhouse gas emissions. Each year, in principle, going out to 2050, we should have fewer emissions. Therefore, the contributions for a given product actually go up. Right. So uh, updating these metrics to the extent that, Steve, I think you're suggesting would be a good thing. It's a necessary thing. Uh, I'm not aware that it is happening. The farther we get from 1990, the harder it is to interpret this result. OK, so we can go on a little bit further in this. Uh, if we want to talk about trying to value, so let's just use the example again, ozone depletion versus uh, global warming. And we could interpret that further by saying, okay, well, what are these emissions, not just in terms of the contribution relative to the average person, but what targets do we have as a country, whether it's Denmark or it could be the European Union or it could be uh, the world at large, IPCC, for instance. So if you took the Let's just take a IPCC target, a global warming target. We're trying to achieve a you know, certain stabilization curve. And we haven't talked about what that means either. Uh, and um, you know, again, we've got some references on that. But you know, we're trying to stabilize the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we're at uh, 390 or so today. Where are we today, carbon dioxide concentration? Anyone? It's about 390. We can use 390. Let's use 390. Best case, uh, 450. We're not going to do better than that, sadly. I mean, we could be optimistic, but um, you know, if we're sensible, 
450 is the best we can do. Now, it uh, goes out about two parts per million a year. We have a developing, um, a lot of people in developing countries that are going to be developing the way we did. Uh, best case, 450. Now, that would lead us to about a two degree Celsius rise. There's a lot of uncertainty, of course, with uh, temperature. Uh, so if you want to stabilize uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide at 450, you basically got to, by about 2050, reduce CO2 emissions uh, by about 80% from where they are today as a globe. And there will be more people. Right? So this is total emissions. So, uh, uh, so, okay, we have a target. And you could think of a pathway to get to that target. So each year we have a target. So you can divide that emission target by the number of people on the planet and say that's your fraction. So you would call that a person equivalent target. And you could look at the life cycle of the refrigerator, refrigerator that total emission, as a fraction of your allocation of the target. And that idea is what's called a milliperson equivalent target. Again, it is taking the global emissions target, or it could be a, a national target, dividing it by the number of people, so that's your fraction, and then you basically look at the life cycle of this refrigerator relative to that total emission. And you have your milliperson equivalent target. And that's a contextualization, right? Because if your milliperson equivalent target actually is low for global warming, and it's high for ozone depletion, that says that relative to the target and your fraction of the target, you worry more about ozone depletion than global warming. So these targets are uh, arrived at, hopefully, through a uh, consensus process, a political process, a, a government stakeholder participation process, and are hopefully legitimate and something that we can use as a means to prioritize. It is not appropriate for you or for me to prioritize. You know, because just because I got a pond behind my house and I really hate the way it looks and smells, uh, doesn't mean I can just say, you know what, the whole story is eutrophication, and this global warming thing ain't important. Right? It's not for me to decide. It is for society. It is for governments and intergovernmental agencies to, or, or um, bodies to, uh, uh, to come up with. Okay? So if you now look at the emissions, global warming, ozone depletion, in this milliperson equivalent target framework, uh, you know now the global warming is about four percent of the milliperson. I'm sorry, of the person equivalent target, and you see ozone depletion is a big deal. So what this means is, you know, relative to the targets that, that, and I don't know if that was a global target at that time for ozone depletion. We did have the Montreal Protocol, so that's reasonable to expect that that was a global target relative to the amount of target emissions for ozone depletion, you know, this is like, you know, 2,600 times or percent of, um, uh, you know, what emission I'm supposed to have. So that is probably an opportunity to improve the sustainability of this refrigerator. And the other ones, acidification, photochemical ozone creation, uh, nutrient enrichment, uh, you know, they're below 1%. And again, it doesn't mean they're not an issue. Maybe the targets are too high for uh, those, those metrics. But it at least gives you some basis to prioritize design action, which is what a valuation approach really should do. It's the idea of a milliperson equivalent target makes sense. Does it work? Go ahead, Jeff. So this is this target is saying we've figured out how much each person should be admitting according to the year 2000 agreement. Um, and this is your percentage of that with this product in a given year. Yeah. OK. Yeah, if you take the percentage value and divide it by 10, you get the milliperson equivalent target. OK, so moving on, uh, you know, you can do this with resource consumption, too. Uh, the only trick here is you, instead of thinking about targets, you think about reserves. So what were the coal reserves? And these are world reserves in 1990. 
for coal and what fraction of that is tied to the life cycle of this refrigerator. And what's kind of crazy about that is you, you look at the milliperson reserve MPR uh, and it's about 0.02%. So the life cycle of this refrigerator uh, is about 0.02% of the uh, the coal reserves, the known economic coal reserves. We'll get to that a little bit more uh, about that in a second. Uh, that, that were available in 1990. Okay, go ahead, Steve. What do you mean the... Well, okay. What does MPR uh, stand for one more time? The Millet Person Reserve. So what it actually is is 0.2% per person of the... It's 0.02%. If you take the total global reserve, right. divide it by the number of people, everybody gets a share. <clears throat> and that person reserve now is, um, you, know, you take this number, it's 0.02% of the fraction of coal available to me based on the reserve base in 1990. So uh, the assumption would be that uh, if you add 6 billion of these refrigerators, then their demand on coal reserves would constitute 0.2% of the sum? Yeah, the world's population yes, was 6 billion at that time. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Got it. It's exactly how you interpret that. Now, it's tricky for a number of reasons. One is the reserve base and the resource base are not the same thing. So what is the difference between a reserve and a resource? From the sound uh, The resource base includes the total, something including anything that might not have been prospected yet or anything that's not economical yet. So the reserve base exactly is, is an economic criterion. So it is not only we know where it is, but it's economic to extract it today. Resource base is the reserves plus everything that might exist. So maybe there's you know some stock of coal on the moon, uh, which would be really interesting uh, if you stop and think about that. And you know it's just not uh, easy to get, right? Yeah, there were dinosaurs up there. It'd be a really cool world there. Uh, but, you know, economics does not play a role into the resource base. It does in the reserve base. So that's why that number is strikingly high, because this is about reserves. And, you know, we've been 30 years away from running out of oil for, you know, I don't know how long. Longer than I've been alive, I think. Uh, so the, these uh, change. Now, and the other thing that's tricky about this is some of these resources are recoverable, they're recyclable and others aren't. So energy resources, you know, once the coal is burned, it's gone. But nickel, you can recycle that. So it does not account for that. So if you were to account for that, you might get something that looks, let me just skip ahead here, uh, you know, for copper, you know, this is the uh, milliperson reserve in 1990. You know, you've got a fairly significant, about 0.1% of a person's share of copper goes into this life cycle of this refrigerator. Okay, but you get almost the same amount back because the copper is going to be recycled under the assumptions of this analysis. So that's why there's a negative value for copper. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. Second diagram. I'm going back Over here? Really yeah. Right. If there's some interdependence between two of the impact potentials, like say global warming and ozone depletion, since Part of that is due to the, the sunlight going through. Um, does it account for that at all? You mean in terms of the impact? Yeah, like if there's any interaction between the two. Yeah. And, and there are. Uh, you know, if you think about, you know, a good one is a photochemical ozone uh, potential. So I, I like this example because uh, smog traps heat. Right. So ozone itself uh, is a greenhouse gas. Ozone depletion, as you destroy ozone, the earth cools a bit. The stratosphere in particular cools. So if you want to like get people off the scent of global warming, you talk about global cooling from ozone depletion and uh, confuse people. Uh, and there's a lot of that going on, or used to be more. Uh, so you deplete the ozone. And now you've had an impact on global cooling, 
The other way around, you have smog and ozone in a city, and that warms up the city. So you have local warming. Interaction effect, again, not considered in this kind of analysis. So I think the, the ideal that I like to think of for these things is let's create, and nobody's done this before, it's like a sim city. It's like the one we all agree on. So uh, here, and maybe you've got like, you think of a car, and you know, you've got highway and city. And we all know what the MPG means, even though uh, we all drive differently and none of us ever exactly achieve that. Right? But there's this drive cycle, and we've got a lot of MEs out there, so you know about the FTP 75, and we just kind of agree on what city means. Right? So imagine we had this sim city, and we sort of agreed on what that, that meant, maybe Chicago or something like that. And now let's just start pumping these emissions and see how it affects this simulated city and actually look at the real impacts. You know, if we understood these interrelationships better, we could capture those interaction effects, but we're nowhere near that today. A lot of knowledge we don't have. So moving over here on the right, what you see is just another instantiation of the milliperson equivalent target, but it's broken down by the materials, by, um, by life cycle stage. So you see disposal, uh, you see heat, uh, you see electricity, you see overhead. So it's just a breakdown. You can get a quick look. You know, the, the ozone depletion, a lot of that happens at disposal because the CFCs escape into the atmosphere. Now, one other point, uh, point to raise about EDIP, and one thing that's interesting here, you talk about sustainability, there's a human impact here, too. So they look at um, safety. And EDIP is very well, it's amenable to thinking about safety. So you can do the same kind of thing. You know, what fraction of reported incidences of uh, workplace accidents were associated with the life cycle of this refrigerator in Denmark? So these are all Denmark. So in this case, it's about, uh, it's like 0.01% of accidents in Denmark in 1990 could be associated with basically the production of this refrigerator, which does occur uh, generally within a year. So over there on the left, this is the weighted potential impacts on the working environment. They look at um, skeletal injuries, hearing impairments, damage to the nervous system, uh, allergies, damage to reproductive system, cancer. Right. Some of these are harder than others. Accidents, probably very easy. OK, I think we've talked about everything here. Questions on EDIP? What was the unit for uh, the previous slide for the and safety incidents. Was the micro uh, uh, related work injury, RWI, or work related injury, and it's easier to say, or impact. Uh, sorry, you say injury and impact. Okay. It's work related. So it's a work related cancer. So you might imagine that that's not the easiest thing to pin down. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, going back a few slides, the the world resource like allocation, is that like a good metric because like the resources are estimated and because things are like economical at certain times and others like is that used very often? It seems like a hard thing to define. It is, and therefore it isn't used very often. And we're talking about ways to interpret data, and um, you know let's not forget. And yeah, you know, we haven't done. Typically in the in the class we've done sort of a philosophy lecture. You know we talk about how markets function, diffusion of you know sustainability in, in markets, and we're going to see some of that as we move forward. But uh, most business as usual is about complying with regulation, right? So this becomes about how did the regulation get formed, and we can get into that. But it's not this process. What we're talking about here is how to interpret life cycle information, and uh, therefore. You know, a number of times it's come up, you know, what about keeping these metrics up to date? Uh, it's basically not done because these are not really used by folks other than researchers. They may be researchers in corporations, they may be consultants, they may be academics who are doing this. Right? But nobody's using this to make uh, laws. Yeah. 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 Y
Other questions? Okay, so, you know, I think we're getting to this point, you know, why there is a, a process for um, arriving at, you know, an impact assessment. And it can't just be somebody sitting in, a, in an office at a desk. These impacts are subjective, so you need some uh, justifiable means to prioritize. They're situational. It depends where you are, when you are. Uh, the interactions with the ecosystem, that's the weakest point, matter a lot. What other controls might exist? You, know, you might have an emission, but you also might have a control. Right? And uh, you know, clearly, these are multidimensional. So uh, environmental impact uh, assessment is difficult. And you know, this idea of trying to come up with a score which is where we started. It's a dangerous thing. Right? They change. This is to, to Steve's point about keeping these up to date. Right? And ISO 14000 does not allow you to aggregate these metrics. So you read about ISO 14000. Looks like the scores on homework one are going to be really good. I just got a feeling about this. Uh, the ISO 14000, what is it? I've got this. Uh, as a means of communicating uh, exactly what you're looking at, but also it doesn't have any way to set boundaries on what you're looking at. Okay, those are both true statements. Uh, it doesn't necessarily define what ISO 14000 is, but there are certainly attributes of 14000 for sure. Uh, ISO 14000 is a family of standards that uh, define the LCA, like how to do LCAs. And uh, like she said, you know, there's no boundaries on, on what you can do and it's not I guess it's it's not really like a, a regulation because it, you don't have to do it but it's kind of just like a guideline as far as how to do them and what to what to do. So the ISO fourteen thousand series contains as Catherine's mentioning here a subset of standards on LCA. And they're general. Uh, you can follow them. There's certainly a way to break them but there's plenty of room for interpretation. So that's the ISO 14040 series. Uh, what else does ISO 14000 as a whole do? I think it's the standards for the environmental management systems as a whole. So when you look across the family, it covers like recycling and things like that, like above and beyond. So product labeling, how to run an environmental management system, exactly. What else? How to present the data that you have. Uh, yeah. Standards on communication, absolutely. So if I have, if I'm certified ISO 14000, am I sustainable? Not everyone would agree. Not everybody agrees. Who says yes? Let's have a vote. I actually don't understand <laughs> your question. Uh, you have two companies. One's ISO 14000 certified, and the other isn't. Uh, they make, they both make widget A. Is the one that's ISO 14000 certified uh, more sustainable, greener, or not? Let's take a vote. So ISO 14000 company is going to produce a greener widget. Who says yes? We've got one, a mere one. It won't. Wait. I'm surprised by that. Okay. And um, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Okay, so basically it's not, the vote is, you didn't know that one was coming because normally I force you to pick a side here. Uh, yeah, I mean the fact is that ISO 14000 uh, is not necessarily correlated. It's being certified uh, with product performance. What ISO 14000 does is it requires you to have a policy to manage your environmental performance. Now, what that policy is, when you actually look at the requirement for what that policy is, it's a little bit disappointing. Because it doesn't say that you know, you're going to be in the top 25% of, um, you know, in terms of environmental performance uh, in your product class or in your industry class. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says that you have a, a, a policy toward the environment 
and you have a management system to um, adhere to that policy, to sort of check to see if that policy is being met. Now that policy cannot be, you know, our policy is to trash the environment. Right? Uh, there was a day when that could have happened, actually. So when you, it's actually very interesting when you look at the politics of how ISO 14000 came to be. You know, there was a camp, uh, primarily in America, that were saying you know, there should be no restriction at all as to what uh, that sort of environmental policy should be. Uh, in the end, there were some um, guidelines. You have to be committed to pol uh, preventing pollution, but what that means is, you know, you're continually. No, I said that wrong. Sorry. You have to be committed to continual improvement, but that doesn't mean continuously reducing your environmental emissions. What continuous improvement can mean in that context is you keep making your management system better. So for those of you who know what ABET review is, like, well, our ABET process keeps getting better. But it doesn't necessarily mean that our classes are getting better, our program's getting better. Uh, there's a pretty strong analogy there to ISO and ABET in that regard. So it's a process-based thing. There are not necessarily um, performance metrics tied to being ISO 14000 certified. Now, if your policy as a company is to be in the top quarter of you know, environmental performance as you define it, then absolutely that is audited. So how you make environmental claims is audited uh, within the ISO 14000 standard. Okay. I'll tell you, my own experience with ISO 14000 is mixed. You know, it's great that it gets companies thinking about the environment and environmental management systems, gets them to, to hire environmental engineers, and that's greater mechanical engineers just as well. And that's all wonderful. Uh, but you know, what would frustrate me, uh, particularly when uh, you know, I was doing graduate research. You know, we would. I was working with the um, Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, and you know, we had uh, sort of a bag of technologies that you know, we would uh, go to companies and sort of demonstrate. We'd do demos within companies. We'd let them keep the equipment, get familiar with it, and write reports basically to show how much money they would save if they installed this pollution and prevention equipment. So. Great, and we used to drive around the state doing this. And you know, there was half a dozen times where you know we drive from Urbana to Chicago or to Springfield or to Peoria or wherever, and you know the the uh, folks that we were supposed to meet with were suddenly unable to meet with us because they had to uh, deal with an ISO 14000 audit, and they were busy you know filling out papers, and they weren't doing any pollution prevention as we could tell. And meanwhile, you know, we're here to save money and uh, actually do the job, and you know, it wasn't quite the priority there. So uh, there was a lot of that going on, and the extent to which that's still happening, you know, uh, I know there's some of it still happening. Uh, Pete. So in a way, is it valid to say that ISO 14000 sort of like foster greenwashing? It can. It certainly can. Right? You raise the flag of ISO 14000 certification and declare victory. Uh, that is absolutely going on. Now, is that greenwashing? Uh, in a lot of cases, that could be harsh. In some cases, it's absolutely true. But it is a, you know, um, it has been utilized and interpreted in manners other than it is. Absolutely. Nicholas? Does this uh, standard require that uh, some of the KPIs or metrics that you use are publicly available? Yes. So if you, uh, and, and that is part of the, I say 14040, you know, if you're going to make claims about your products, then you have to have some type of uh, either product certification, which is a set of standards, or an LCA, which is a set of standards. So uh, random claims, they won't allow you to, to go for that. So there are process uh, steps to publicizing data. But can you claim, not claim anything? Yes. So you can say, I am ISO 14000, but I won't say anything publicly about what I do. The, um, it depends what you mean by public. So there are audits that um, you know, basically you become ISO 14000 certified. There's a process through which that happens. And that means an auditor has come, and they're going to check out your environmental management system. You are not required to do a sustainability report. Right? Uh, so. Um, you know, and, and for some ISO 14000 certified companies, you want to go find that information about them. It's very hard. Now, there are toxic release inventory data that all companies 
are required to release, uh, but that has nothing to do with ISO 14000 certification. These are great questions. Okay. So, you know, with how how environmental impacts are inherently subjective, situational, and multidimensional, I I can see where, you know, like a lot of critics would come in and criticize all these measures that we have. And so without sort of like large scale behavioral change and large scale, you know, sort of like shift towards a sustainable sustainability minded thinking, I have I have a trouble trusting in the power and the ability of these tools to really make a huge difference in terms of what we what how we're gonna move ahead in the future. Well, uh, you're talking at societal level, I think. Right? If I'm at a company and I'm given the charge uh, to uh, make this product greener. Uh, I have to explain it to my boss and to the team I'm working with. Can this stuff help? Absolutely. Uh, will it change the world? Absolutely not. Right. So it depends on what level of change. LCIs uh, tend to be conducted at companies that are large, multinational, who care about this stuff, who want to, who don't want surprises, basically. And uh, you know, they when a uh, decision is going to claim to be green. Uh, and maybe you're even going to sacrifice, because this does happen on occasion, where, you know, um, I mean, you know, corporate good behavior or stewardship of the environment, that's not um, something that is all that rare. Because, you know, folks like us, you know, work in these companies, right? So they want to do the right thing. Uh, but this question of how do you evaluate a change environmentally and explain it, um, you're generally not going to do that to the public. You're not going to use these metrics. For the public, you're gonna, you know, focus on something else. But internally, for technical people, uh, this stuff can make sense and gets used that way. Yeah, I was just looking through my list here. We're doing really well. Okay, so this is why um, these tables uh, tend to be difficult. Uh, let's see what we haven't talked about in the Eco, 90, Eco Indicator 99. Okay, we talked about NOx, we talked about SOx. We didn't talk about ammonia. What's ammonia? This is NHC. Wasn't in your reading either. Okay. Ammonia is another, you know. Uh, well, the, uh, it's it's another thing that could lead to you know high nutrition levels in uh, yeah, in the water because there are bacteria that can metabolize it into uh, you know I into nutrients that uh, you know would uh, cause eutrophication and think problems like that. So okay, so it's a nutrient, uh, and where does it come from? Industrial processes. Okay. We all know what pesticides are. We haven't mentioned heavy metals. Uh, not the music, I guess. <laughs> so where are we concerned about heavy metals? <clears throat> heavy metals are toxic in relatively small concentrations and they're also persistent. It's really hard to get them into an innocuous form. They tend to hang around. Exactly. So uh, persistence and their uh, impacts on people uh, at, at a number of levels uh, at low concentrations, right? Uh, and are they air pollutants or water pollutants? Yes. Both. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Both. Yes. Uh, so where do they come from in the air? Uh, Go ahead, up. Uh, lead, for example, can come from. Uh, the uh, tetraethyl lead in, uh, you know, which is there in, uh, you know, in gasoline, petrol, uh, the old petrol which you used to have. So um, nowadays it's not allowed. So that's how it gets in the atmosphere in the form of its uh, compounds. So as far as mercury is concerned, mercury has vapors. Uh, and uh, these vapors, again, can stick, uh, stick around the atmosphere for quite a while. So mercury and coal. And coal, yeah. So, so those are air, heavy metals in air, for instance. How about heavy metals in water? Where do they come from? Go ahead, Dave. Mining. Uh, mining, absolutely. Where else, Nicholas? Uh, lead can come from hunters. Oh, nice. Hunters, yeah. Shells. 
Where else? And that? I guess electronics that are disposed of improperly a lot of times have a lot of lead left in them that can seep. And yeah, or even if it ends up in a landfill in some places, that's legal and you've got leachate coming out of the landfill it's going to have lead in it. That's a good one. So these are uh, older plumbing. Older plumbing. It's a mechanical engineering crowd. I just thought like electroplating or something manufacturing might come up. Uh, so manufacturing is, is a big one. Right, plating is a good example. Uh, the um, even machining, uh, you know, st uh, steels, for instance, that might have uh, amounts of uh, heavy metals in them. Uh, it's another source. So, Lisa, and tissues is going to also build up along the way in the food chain. So, um, at the very top of the food chain, you'd have heavy tissues. Yeah, so this bioaccumulation becomes an issue uh, with the heavy metals. Right, so it ends up in the water, and then you eat the fish, worked its way up the, the food chain in between. Right, so that's a concern. So uh, the course has a long history in manufacturing. And some of the uh, Winter 10 archive videos, if you're interested in uh, pollution uh, from the metals industry, from the plastics industry, uh, where that comes from uh, in manufacturing, some of the manufacturing processes and their emissions, uh, you can review some of that older video. We talked about uh, VOCs and polyaromatic hydrocarbons in the context of smog. Uh, we didn't talk about particulate matter. Uh, we didn't talk about radiation. Uh, but we almost got through all of these. Okay, so next time, what we're going to do is we're going to stare at this one a little bit longer. Uh, we haven't covered all these, so we will. And uh, we will. Uh, then work our way into environmental systems analysis and uh, work our way forward into water pollution, uh, thinking about this big river problem. All right, so have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.